It's good to be back on the stage after so many years. Think for a moment about a question that I'm going to pose to you today. And think about, would you believe me if I told you that somebody's life could be changed with somebody else's garbage? Our fast-paced world of technology, our schedules, our over-programmed lives, everything we do to consume, consume, push, push, maximize, extend our bandwidth, and try to soak it all in, it has become harder and harder to be present. It's become harder and harder to be in the moment with somebody, to have a one-on-one -on -one communication or to find something out about somebody new. To be mindfully aware of personal connections that have a lasting impact on others. I want to ask you, how do you put a price on hope? How do you put a value on that? How do you place a value on bringing out an emotion in somebody? And what does that look like? How do you put a value on validating someone's very existence? These are questions that I've struggled with for the last 10 years. But these are the questions that I found answers to in 2007. For over 15 years, I was a film and television producer. I worked with some of the largest and most famous stars that you've seen in magazines. I worked in some of the great studios. And I did projects all around the world, creating great stories, some of them, not all of them, and filling this consumer world full of entertainment. 2007 was a very, very big year for me. I took a documentary film crew to Nepal and spent 28 days, much of it at the uh, base camp of Everest. Did lots of things where you should come back broken and battered, came back just fine. Also went helicopter skiing and did another project in British Columbia doing things that you really shouldn't be doing and you should come back broken and battered, came back fine. And on July 29th, 2007, I had a near fatal accident where I was working on a warehouse on the north side of town here and doing a basic DIY project, fixing the roof. The roof was leaking, and it was time to fix it Florida style, which just means put a tarp on it and deal with it next year. <laughs> up and down the ladder, up and down the ladder, and for some reason on the 15th or 16th time, I stepped on the top of the ladder and the bob collapsed, and I fell about a story and a half face down on the concrete. The result of my injuries were a broken left arm, broken left wrist, broken right wrist, right elbow, broken right femur, broken nose and 10 skull fractures just like that. In a year when I should come back broken and battered and was fine, a simple accident almost prevented me from being here with you today. I was rushed to UT Medical Center level one trauma and I was in the ICU for ten to, uh, two days. I was in the level one trauma center for 10 days, Patricia Nail rehab facility for 10 days, three and a half months in a wheelchair and 13 surgeries and counting putting me back together. It was back to that very first week, and I want to take you back to those first few days where I was really trying to rebuild my life, where I was trying to find a way to determine what the new normal would be and what my path forward would be, that something happened. In addition to family and friends and people who so showed their support to me, I began getting deliveries of flowers. I had never been given flowers before. Most guys have never been given flowers in their entire life. And day after day, one bouquet turned into three, turned into six, turned into 12, turned into 20. And by the end of the first week, I had a jungle of joy and happiness. I had an amazing outpouring of support from people who said, we are here, today is day one, what can we do to help you? And that came in the way of flowers. And every time I had an option of sort of going down that path of woe is me, this is gonna be awful, I'm gonna dive into every medication they give to me, and I'm never going to be the same again, another bouquet would arrive. And every time somebody walked into the room, I didn't matter if it was a doctor, a nurse, a janitor, a caregiver, they smiled. Every time a bouquet filled another corner of the room, and these are not very big rooms, it smelled a little better. It looked a little bit better. And everyone's reaction changed. And I remember those moments and that was all about me. And then by the end of the first week, I got stir crazy. I was really, really not excited about being there. And I convinced the nurses and my family to get me into a wheelchair, which took almost an hour. Bags, casts, IVs, all kinds of stuff. I said, just get me out of my room. I just got to get outside. 
And the minute we left my room, we entered what I can only describe to you as a world of stark hospitalization. Sterile, cold, blah. We left my jungle of joy and happiness, and room after room we went by, it were lifeless rooms. No visitors, no flowers, no plants, nothing. And it was such a contrast to me, it was really simple. I just asked to go back to my room. We didn't follow protocol, we didn't ask permission, we didn't see if it was okay, it was the right thing to do. We took the cards off my flowers, we loaded up my wheelchair with as much as we could do, hold at the time with all the casts, and we just started going room to room because there were so many people far worse off than I was that had nothing and we had this jungle of joy and celebration of life. I'll never forget the very first room we went into. It was a woman who was right next door and we had heard her cries of pain and her moans and her hurt all week long to something you'd never want to hear. And she was in full sort of headgear traction, wired up and all kinds of really th bad things. And I remember as we rolled into that room, remembering how stark it was. It was clear she was not there with anyone else. No one was there to take care of her. And she had these look of, in, these, in her eyes of these desperate eyes you never want to see in somebody. It's the look of, I'm done. Pull the plug, help. It's the desperate eyes you never want to see, ever. And we gave her a big bouquet of flowers. And she went from that look to smiling and crying in two seconds. I couldn't do anything about her emotional state. I did everything about her emotional state. I couldn't do anything about her physical recovery. I couldn't do anything about what she was going to face or how she was going to make it happen. For, for one second, we changed that perspective by giving her a bouquet of flowers. The very next room we went to was a gentleman taking care of his wife. She was dying of cancer and she had had a fall and we had a very traumatic accident. And he told us how he was a gardener and how he used to take care of this amazing garden, but he neglected it for years because he'd been taking care of it, her, rightfully so. And we gave him this big plant that somebody had sent me. And he was amazing that, to see him hug that plant and look at it. We gave him his garden back. He had something to take care of while he took care of her. And we switched that emotional state for just a second. Room after room after room, the same kind of stories over and again. And it was a really, really profound effect on me during a really tough time. During the next six months or so, I, I spent a lot of time in a wheelchair, and when you spend a lot of time in a wheelchair, you spend a lot of time alone. Even if there are other people around, you are isolated and you think a lot. And I spent a lot of time going through physical therapy, a lot of surgeries, a lot of retraining my body on how to walk, how to do things that seem so normal. And so you, you dive into yourself, and I kept thinking about those interactions, saying, come on, somebody must be doing this. This is kind of a no-brainer, right? Somebody must be doing this. So I look locally, nothing. Regionally nothing, nationally nothing. I found a few stories about people who had taken flowers and done something with them, but nothing that was organized that said, look, we have an immense amount of a perishable product that could be used to impact the world. And so about six months into my recovery, I came up with a half clever name, a couple of bad logo ideas, a few bullet points on a napkin, sat down with my wife and said, I think I have something that could help and I could channel what I was doing in recovery to help somebody else. And that was the genesis for Random Acts of Flowers. On the very first day, we just started. I called a bunch of friends. I called people that sent me flowers and asked for donations. I called friends that were in the healthcare industry and said, I have an idea. I called people in the floral industry and said, I have an idea. We gathered a bunch of people, and I always say that we are in a unique place here in the volunteer spirit is alive and well, where people rush in and say, how can I help? And then they figure out the details later. And everyone said, great, let's figure it out. And we went back to UT Medical Center and we asked, could we do this? And of course, everybody thought, okay, what's the catch? And I said, there's no catch, and I explained it, and we just got started. And we did the very first delivery about six months later to the floor that I was in, to the room that I was in, and that was our launching point. We didn't have a clue what we were doing, but we knew it was the right thing to do. And that has been the genesis for our organization ever since. From that very first delivery to today, what our organization is about is a simple moment of kindness. It's a connection between one person and another person, the flowers of the vessel, the flowers of the catalyst, but it's really about that human and emotional connection and that has not changed since. Now I never imagined when I started this organization that might just help the person next door, might just help a couple of people in East Tennessee, that we would have such an um, amazing opportunity to nudge the world. 
We've had a little bit of a growth curve over the years, and uh, to think that in the first few years we were serving a few thousand people, and last year we served over 102,000 people nationwide, is uh, really daunting, really exciting, and really terrifying all at the same time as you grow something and create something. But the idea of knowing that our community has helped almost 300,000 people with that moment of kindness and is growing at a rate of 10 or 15,000 more people every single month is really something I'm very proud of and very excited about. I want to take a minute to look below the surface a little bit and find out more about why this means so much and why it is so universal. Healthcare, healthcare itself is really fascinating. I have been in every shape or place as a, a consumer of healthcare. I've been a worried father. Uh, I've been a coach and a mentor to others. I have been a really confused patient a lot of times. And um, something that is really amazing to me is that how much of healthcare focuses on the physical and not on the emotional and not on the mental state. And we know that this connects to this, which connects to everything else and how much we never talk about that. And I, I hope that there's a shift in the coming days. It's amazing what it can do on an emotional level. I want you to hear something that might express why and how something like this can make an impact on someone. Hi, my name's Michelle. I'm a patient at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. And I just wanted to thank you for the flowers. I got them on Tuesday, shortly after I was admitted, and I had had a very difficult day. and. They still look incredibly beautiful, and they're one of the nicest things that's happened to me since I've been here, so thank you very much. We get cards and letters and emails every day saying, you'd have no idea what this meant. Something so simple can change my day and my perspective. We know that there is more to giving flowers than it's just nice. We really do. We have empirical, we have medical evidence, we have lots of data. In 2001, a Rutgers University study found that flowers ease depression, improve social interaction, enhance memory in ages of 55 and older. Another study at Harvard University and at UMass found that not only does receiving flowers have health benefits, but simply displaying fresh, fresh cut flowers in the home increases feelings of compassion, decreases anxiety, boasts energy and enthusiasm. Another study in 2009 by Kansas State found that patients in rooms with plants and flowers had significantly shorter hospitalizations, lower rates of pain, anxiety, fatigue, and more positive feelings. And right here at home, an empirical study was done in 2016 on us at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, and they specifically confirmed a couple of really amazing things. The impact that we had on the emotional wellness of medical patients, almost 95% of people that they surveyed self-reported that an unexpected delivery of flowers from our organization improved their overall emotional state, and 74% reported extreme improvement. And you'd think, wow, this is really working. But here's the thing that really kicked me on this. The study also reaffirmed that we are serving patients who are typically not getting any emotional connection beyond the immediate caregivers. 81% of people reported they had not received other gifts of flowers from anyone else during their stay. And 11%, let me repeat that, 11% said we were the only person that they saw during their stay, the only visitor they had, and the only emotional connection to the outside world. That is both daunting and inspiring to me, and that's what we work on every day. Now, if you will, for just a second, I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes for just one second. Imagine you're in a hospital. Imagine you're in a nursing home. Imagine you're all alone. Perhaps you're scared. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you're nervous. What would it mean for a visitor to walk in the door with a bouquet of flowers? I'm at Tim, uh, area code 650-215-2851. And the callback is not necessary. It's just I wanted to thank the uh, random acts of flowers. You delivered a beautiful plant to me, which I was not expecting. And it's lovely. It's green and white with touches of purple. And it certainly brightens the room and makes me feel cheerful. And that was so kind. I do want to thank the uh, charitable organization that did this. I made me feel really happy. Thank you so much. Bye. Now, even though that sped up a little bit from what the original voicemail was, thank you for remembering me. Thank you for knowing I'm here. 
That's the power of giving flowers, and that's the power of the human connection that we serve every day. Something so simple and so powerful. As it was said in my introduction, I just truly believe and I know that the giving of flowers is one of the most universal gestures that cuts across all races, religions, genders, income levels, language barriers. I have given thousands and thousands of bouquets and they have been to the grumpiest old men or the sweetest little girls or the visitor that is an unexpected person at the, at the moment of our impact. And every type of person you can imagine, it always results in one thing, a smile. I asked Hope when she came out here, look at the audience when you walk out with a bouquet of flowers and see how many people are smiling in this audience right now. I guarantee you it was most of you. When I say that this is a universal gesture, I really mean it. And it was impacted, it was imp embedded in me in one day when I knew that it transcended even disabilities. I went to Little Creek up the road several years ago, and this is the actual picture. And this nurse here is, her name is Gina. We went to college here at the University of Tennessee, funny enough, in the theater department. And I was there and we were doing a delivery and Gina said, grab the most fragrant flowers on the cart. I've got a great delivery for you. And I don't know much about flowers, ironically enough. So I stood there a little dumbfounded. And so she said, here, take this. And so she said, come on. And we walked towards this room and she stopped me and she said, she's blind. And I was caught off guard. I didn't know, I'd never been in a situation like this. I didn't know what to do. One of our earlier speakers talked about this. I was caught off guard. I'd never given flowers to a blind person before. She said, come on. And we walked in the room, and in the corner was this woman, and she sat up out of her chair, and she said, those are stargazer lilies. She smelled them immediately. And every step we walked into the room, you could have pumped life into her as she sat up, and she smelled the flowers, and she held our hands, and she touched the flowers, and she told us how she was a gardener, and she told us of the amazing memories of her life. And she couldn't see him, but it didn't matter. How do you put a price on bringing a memory back to somebody and delivering that? And that was really cool. I offer you one last story, one last bit of evidence that the power of flowers can be healing for everybody involved, the giver and the receiver. And I'll share with you my aha moment where several years ago, we had a large wedding season, lots of red roses, and I was at one of our partner hospitals. And one of the nurses came down to the hall and she said, Larson, 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 one of my patients is on the list. She hasn't had a visitor in two weeks. I don't expect her to live another week. You gotta give her flowers. I said, great. I picked up a big bouquet of red roses. I knocked on the door. I said, hi, I have a delivery for you. I poked my head in, very frail, old, elderly woman. And she put her hand up and she said, those are not for me, you have the wrong room. I said, I don't have the right, wrong room, they are for you, I insisted, I started to walk in, and she put her hand up again. She said, there's a mistake, those are not my flowers, those are not for me. Only person ever to refuse me twice in a situation like this. I said, they are for you, and I insisted on giving her the flowers, and as soon as she grabbed the bouquet, it was like a, a vessel for the biggest emotional drop you've ever seen. Tears and joy and laughing and smiling and crying, and and it was unbelievable as I watched her look at those. And she mumbled something, something about hadn't getting, gotten flowers, I, I couldn't quite hear. And I said, excuse me, could you please repeat that? She grabs my arm, she looks right through me and she says, you don't understand. No man has ever given me roses in my entire life. You don't know what this means. And I was crying, she was crying, we were a mess, we had a great moment. And I stood outside that room and I said, wow, we just changed somebody's life after 94 years and we did it with somebody else's garbage. That's cool and that's why I'm all in. Take a moment today, take a moment this week during a really critical holiday and think about somebody. Think about somebody with flowers, go sit down with them, make the human connection, change the world, smile. Thank you. <laughs>